first of uh, six sessions that we'll be having over the next two days of uh, you presenting your and defending your thesis work. Um, how it's going to work, as you know, you have 15 minutes, and I'm also addressing the people online about this, uh, but we just connected, so there's nobody online right now, I think. Yep, no, there's nobody. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> they will come, don't worry. Um, and this is recorded also. So you have 15 minutes to do your presentation. Uh, I will be timing it. When uh, we get to the 12 minute mark, I will give you a sign. That means you have three minutes. And I'll give you another sign uh, when uh, you have uh, one minute to go. Okay. I won't be standing up because that's really uh, disconcerting. But if you go over time, uh, if you go over 15 minutes, then I will stand up. And you need to wrap it up as soon as possible. Okay. So Good. the floor is yours. You uh, all the best. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to present the the master thesis that I did in Chile with E.B. Wilders and Alison Jena on kelp forest modeling. So in general, all along the coastline of Chile, there are um, in the subtidal zone there are extensive um, canopy forming kelp forests. And in general, kelp forests provide some very important ecosystem services, such as providing habitat to a tremendous biodiversity. However, in uh, Chile, the kelp harvesting industry is a growing industry. And um, in 2019, Chile was already the first, the, the first harvester of red and brown algae in the world. So Chile implemented lots of uh, kelp harvesting uh, guidelines uh, in order to reduce the depletion of uh, the kelp forest, as well as its uh, fragmentation. So when it comes to fragmentation in, in general, um, we, we consider it as a, as a negative phenomenon since the fragmentation of, a, of an ecosystem, of a, of a forest in this case, um, leads to the increase of the amount of edges in the, in the forest. And it, it, um, the, amount, the increase of the amount of edges induces the increase of the edge effect which is um, the fact that uh, a kelp individual on the edge of the forest will be uh, exposed to um, higher intensities of pressures uh, from uh, uh, like herbivory or wave disturbance than a plant that would be in the middle uh, of the forest. So to work with uh, fragmentation and, uh, and spatial patterns in general, um, lots of studies have been carried out uh, as a monitoring service, but we tried to adopt uh, another approach, a modeling approach. So we uh, used a cellular automaton uh, model that is uh, a big grid of cells in which each cell has one state. And uh, this, um, in our model, we defined three different states. Uh, we defined the rock state, um, the juvenile uh, kelp, and adult kelp. Um, this model is dynamic and um, discrete in time. It means that we start at time zero, then time one, time two, time three. And at each uh, time step, there is a certain probability of transition uh, of each cell. So uh, a cell that is a rock can be colonized by, by uh, juveniles, by sporophytes, and uh, become a juvenile cell. Uh, the juvenile can grow into an adult, and adult as well as juveniles can uh, have a certain probability to die and go back to the rock state. So this model is dynamic in space and time. Um, and one a big advantage of this kind of model is the fact that we can uh, study the local environment of each cell. It means that we can look at the neighboring cells of each cell. And this is a very big advantage of this model. So in general, we try to build a, a model of the dynamics of the forest involving trophic and non-trophic interactions. And we parameterize these interactions with empirical data. And on top of this, uh, of this, of this model, sorry, we added some additional pressures, such as um, herbivory harvesting, but also fragmentation, to see how the, the dynamic of the model uh, would be. So first, we started with the data that we had uh, that was collecting, collected between uh, 2018 and 2022 in central Chile, in Punta de Tralca. Um, this, in this place, there is a, a big forest of uh, Lesenia trabeculata, um, in which lots of parameters were defined, were measured, such as growth rate, mortality, and many others. Uh, so all the parameters were measured in the forest, on the edge of the forest, and outside the forest. Um, 
So, yes, so for example, the, the density of juveniles was defined in the forest, on the edge of the forest, and outside. And the contrasting parameters were uh, implemented in the model. So we had a, a whole set of data that enabled to, to retrieve lots of parameters that we fed in our uh, cellular automaton model. You recognize the three states of the model, and I'm going to focus on one of the transitions, which is the, the easiest one between juvenile and adult. So this transi transition has uh, three parameters, three main parameters, a growth rate that we turn into a certain probability of, um, of transition between juvenile and adult. Um, we also implemented the, the, the shading, the light competition between plants. So it means, for example, a juvenile that would be in the middle of the forest would, uh, re wouldn't receive um, uh, as much light as a, a juvenile that would be outside the forest because of the surrounded adult curves. So the, the light competition is very related to the, or it's directly related to the local curve density. So if uh, we are in the middle of the forest, uh, there will be lots of uh, adult curves around, so we will have Q equal one, and then we will have a shading effect and a reduction of the growth rate. Um, but if we are in a bare area, then there is no, there are no uh, neighboring uh, adult curves, so Q will be equal to zero, and we will have a maximum growth rate for the juvenile. So yes, we have um, our data, we managed to retrieve lots of parameters, we implemented them in our model to have a the dynamics, and on top of that, we add some harvesting scenarios. So we have seven harvesting scenarios. <coughs> so the first one is no harvesting. The second one is harvesting following all the, ex the, the extraction guidelines of Chile. Um, and then from the scenario three to the scenario seven, we have a range of harvesting uh, scenario uh, harvesting intensities. Scenario seven being the, the worst case scenario where harvesting is very strong. And I would like to, uh, to detail a little bit the scenario three um, as an example. Um, so yes, scenario three uh, represents the fact that fishermen, instead of removing the entire plants uh, of the substrate when harvesting, they will cut the stipe and the whole fast will stay in the, in the landscape and will avoid the, the settlement of uh, sporophytes and new juveniles on the substrate. So it will be a degradation scenario where the dynamics of the, the forest will be um, damaged. Yeah. And yeah, so we have uh, the dynamics of the forest, we have harvesting scenarios, but we need to start somewhere. So we need to initialize the model with uh, initial landscapes. So we define three levels of uh, initial percentage cover. So 25 percentage cover, 50 percent, and 75 percent. And we dissociated three uh, initial fragmentation levels. So for example, all these three um, landscapes have the same percentage cover, but different uh, fragmentation. So this is low fragmentation, and this is high fragmentation. And fragmentation in general, we measured it with the Perimeter over area ratio. So now we're ready to run the, the simulations. Uh, the first result that I'm going to show will concern the uh, low initial fragmentation. So these three uh, landscapes. So we have low initial fragmentation, and we we see the three initial percentage cover levels um, that are the shades of blue. Of oh, blue, uh, yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> We, ra we ran the simulation over uh, 100 years uh, to reach equilibrium, but we also looked at the, the state of the model after one year in order to understand a bit more the dynamics of the uh, model. We displayed um, two parameters, the percentage cover as lines and the fragmentation level as dots. As a horizontal axis, it's not time, it's herbivory intensity. So the higher is the herbivory intensity, the lower is the percentage cover, and the higher is the fragmentation. So, and this happens also after 100 years. Um, so we, we see that um, have a, uh, heavy very intensity has a very strong effect on the dynamics of the model. Um, a second point I would like to, to stress is the, the effect of initial percentage cover, so the shades of blue. Uh, you, you can dissociate after one year the different uh, the different uh, uh, 
initial percentage cover levels, but after 100 years, you can't. So there is a, uh, an effect of initial percentage cover, but on a short term scale. Now I'm going to show you the, 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 the effect of uh, initial fragmentation on the dynamics of the model, and which is actually very low. So top row, we have um, low fra initial fragmentation, medium in, uh, initial fragmentation, and high initial fragmentation. And you, can, you can't see much difference between the, the older graphs. So it means that there is a very low impact of initial fragmentation on the dynamics of the model, which was a bit disappointing on the moment, but we're fine with that. So a second simulation that I would like to show is um, a simulation that we ran over one year, and halfway we applied a harvesting uh, event. So, um, and so yeah, the simulation was run during one year. Six, six year simulation, uh, six months of simulation, harvesting, six months of simulation. And uh, we display again the percentage cover, the fragmentation over a heavy, very intensity gradient. And we have our seven scenarios, uh, scenario one being no harvesting, and which retrieves some high percentage covers, and uh, scenario seven being um, very intense and retrieving some uh, low percentage covers. And we see a very good gradient, the colors are not displayed very well, but a very good gradient of um, um, harvesting damage uh, to the to the care forest caused by the different um, harvesting scenarios. The last example I would like to show you is a um, is an example of uh, what to do with our model or what can be done with our model. So it's a, a management and conservation uh, application um, of uh, of our work. So during at the beginning we ran the simulation during two years with high herbivory and high um, harvesting uh, pressure. So the, the, the percentage cover of the, of the landscape uh, decreased a lot and, um, and we simulated a, a decision-making moment where four paths, uh, four, four paths could be taken, four scenarios could be, uh, could be taken. So the first one is a degradation scenario where nothing would be done. Uh, no, no, um, harvesting will stay high, herbivory will stay high, and there would be a, a collapsing uh, of the forest after the two years, two years after the decision making. The second scenario is an enforcement scenario in which um, all the, the extraction guidelines would be applied. So it's the scenario two, if you remember, of the, our extraction scenarios. And, um, and yes, and this, uh, this. Uh, scenario would enable to, um, to postpone the, the collapsing of the forest of almost four years, which is quite good, but it didn't enable the forest to recover. Then we have two other scenarios, which are the implementation of a territorial user right fishery regime and the implementation of a marine protected area. In the turf, uh, we have um, the, the enforcement of all the extraction guidelines um, and whereas in the, the marine protected area, there is prohibition of harvesting. Um, in these two regimes, uh, in these two, um, yes, in these two uh, scenarios, we implemented something a bit different than the, the two previous ones because uh, Pérez Matus, uh, you can see Pérez Matus uh, <laughs> uh, in 2017 uh, published a paper about um, about the, the fact that implementing this kind of uh, regimes enable the, the, the top predators to recolonize the area and to uh, control the herbivore, the herbivore's density. So we, uh, we um, modeled a gradual decrease of herbivory intensity after the implementation of these two scenarios. And uh, this implementation of, uh, of uh, herbivory decrease over time, enabled the, the, the forest to recover from the degraded state. And you can see that uh, the turf um, scenario is also nicer in terms of, uh, uh, as a social aspect, because the EMPA forbids any harvesting, uh, and so there is no, uh, it's, a, it's a very important resource for the people, so enabling the people to still harvest a little bit is, is very important as well. So, so yeah, and so this is a very good example of 
uh, conservation measures that can be taken um, based on our, uh, our work. So as a conclusion, uh, the main drivers of the, of the uh, model are ecological and physiological parameters, variables, um, such as herbivory. Herbivory was the, the main driver. Um, but overall, we have, um, we have an implementation of the fragmentation that, was, uh, that had a very low impact on the model. Um, a very big improvement that could be, that could be done uh, in the future would be uh, an empirical uh, validation of our model because we, we parameterized our model with empirical data, but we should try to validate our, our model with uh, empirical experiments. So this, this should be uh, done in the future. And overall, our model is a very good, uh, well, I think it's a, a conservation tool uh, quite important for, for, for the management, and it could be applied to many other fields such as um, restoration projects, um, which is a very um, burning topic uh, right now. So now I would like to thank you for, for your attention, uh, my wonderful supervisors, as well as um, the entire team of scientists and students of ESIM. Thank you very much. dynamic and interesting presentation, perfect timing, so um, I didn't take time to introduce the members of the jury, so maybe before you, yeah, you ask your questions, you can, yeah, you can introduce Yeah, before you this, I hear from the University of Oviedo, you work on uh, ecology and marine ecology. Okay, nice to meet you. Jose uh, Rico, also from the department and also marine ecology. And you have met uh, Victor by this yes. time, all of you. So uh, maybe for the people online, you can yeah. see who you are. Yeah, so I'm Victor. I'm, I'm a PhD student at the University of uh, Western Brittany. And I'm working on benthic ecology and also theoretical ecology in general. Um, yeah. And I'm Olivier Gauthier, the coordinator for review. And uh, benthic ecologist also. So we have a, yeah. a panel of benthic ecologists. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Will you do us the honors? Yes, yes, yes. Sure. all right. Thank you for your presentation. And I have two questions to get in. And uh, how is the present level of fragmentation of natural populations? Um, in, in your scheme, you propose three levels of fragmentation. Which is the real situation yes. in, uh, in the field? Uh, well, it, it, the, the landscape that I have, um, they are at the uh, all the landscapes that I had were like two hundred, were representing two hundred by two hundred meters uh, landscapes. Um, so um, I think they are quite fragmented. They are very, quite, especially concerning Lesonia trabeculata, this uh, this species. They are quite fragmented, and and that uh, means and that, means that um, that all along the, the coastline of Chile, you you have uh, lots of uh, areas where. Um, you have some some small patches of forest a bit everywhere, but you don't have like an uh, an extensive, very extensive uh, forest, very continuous. But the, the the species is is present a bit everywhere in Chile, but very uh, fragmented. Yeah, and uh, because my question is if the the present level of fragmentation is in that way, so you have only small patches. Why not start the simulations using real data, real situation, and forget uh, ideal scenarios with no fragmentation? Well, um, that that that's an interesting question. But uh, like for uh, oh, okay. yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but when, when implementing or when starting initially initializing our our models, it was quite hard to 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 fragment the the, the landscape very very much. And it was easier, at least visually, and to, to, to be sure about what we were doing and, and the yeah. dynamics of the model, to keep some, some, some um, different levels. And to see that, OK, if we have a very low fragmentation, uh, it looks like this, and we obtain this. And, and I could display, uh, I have also a, a little animation, if, if you want to see. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it, 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 um, you can really see the landscape. You can display it and, and really have a look at how it looks like. And so it was, it was very easy for us to work with these um, 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then, yes, the second question is that same. Yes, sir, suggestive more than. So, you describe different uh, levels of uh, harvesting, and I assume that uh, you harvest every year. Exactly. And what about harvesting every second year for single patches? So perhaps you give more time to recover. And that's a, a, a management strategy that works in, for all these species. Definitely. That, that, that would be very interesting also to, to implement. But the, the problem is that in Chile, there is very low enforcement of the, of the regulations. And but that's education. That's education, yeah, but also, I don't know, yes, probably education. There was a workshop in, in at the, the session where I was. It was very interesting, and fishermen also came and discussed with the, with the scientists. It was very rich of, of conversations, and um, you could see that they, they were very willing to do this kind of spacing in time, and they already do it. But you have a lot of illegal fishing with fishermen that are not, not um, registered. And so you have some, most of the, the, the camp forest are harvested more than once a year. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, so, so yes, it, it would be good if we could enforce. I heard that in Brazil, I had a friend uh, who was there and he said that there was a very strong enforcement, uh, like some, some authorities that were going around uh, very regularly and it seemed very impressive. Absolutely in another case in Chile. So being able to space in time would be probably the best to have the time to recover for the forest and to harvest again, but... Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah, thank you. It was very, very interesting, actually, the modeling of the, of the harvesting uh, strategies and how just, just to question one is, when you refer to the herbivory uh, pressure, you mentioned, uh, at least in the exercise of, of the model, is in kilograms per square meter. Yes. But the scale goes from zero to one. Yes. So, I mean, it's just from zero kilograms per square meter to one kilogram per square meter the herbivory, or is just that you transform it in a uh, zero to one hundred? No, no, no. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, zero kilogram per, per square meter and one kilogram per square meter. So it's very extreme, but uh, because this is a, a case where there is a lot of herbivory, so we could maybe have reduced a little bit. But we started working with this range not knowing, actually. Uh, okay, so that, that amount of they are consuming, the herbivores are consuming. Yes. Uh, and what is the density, in the, the normal density in an stand of the Sonia, in kilograms per square meter? Uh, first, uh, in, uh, in individuals per square meter, it's about like a healthy forest would be two. In the forest where we were, it was 0 0.56 according to another IMBSC study uh, from last year. And um, so it's, it's um, and one individual, when it's old, it can weigh a lot, like um, around 40 kilos. Uh, because uh, usually the, 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 even the individuals uh, form like a coalescence, and so they, they have a, a very big disc, and so many types, and, and so it's very, very big organisms. So, so yes. Uh, calculation 0 0.5 times uh, times 40 is 20 20 20 uh, kilos per, per square meter when you have a, a cap. Herbivore intensity is not very high in terms of biomass. It can be very high, I guess. Yeah. When they are uh, feeding on the juveniles, I guess that there's yeah. the main impact. Which is the main herbivore in this area? Archie, archies. No, it, that, that was surprising because um, so there they were lots of uh, surveys that, was ca that were carried out and urchins were not in the forest that we were studying, they were mainly uh, sea snails. And that can sound uh, very small, like a sea snail, but actually they, ha they are very aggressive. Uh, <laughs> they are in one day, they, they, they call it uh, outbreaks. And so in, and apparently it would happen more at night. Uh, so it would be a, a, a nocturnal feeding behavior. And they all gather uh, on the same plant and, this, and they decide to eat it. So from a day to another, I have a, um, at the very end, I have a slide with, um, yes, the picture. Wow. So <laughs> we, we can't see it very much, but 
but here it's like they call it skeleton because uh, they, they eat all the surface of the of the cup and there is only white uh, structures inside structures and it's very yes uh, they are dead at this stage they are dead and, and in the following uh, days or weeks they will be removed of, of the substrate and with the currents sometimes they even accumulate in some symmetries of 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 cup forest so it's very impressive. Yeah, a final question is, uh, you, you have tested like uh, seven different management strategies and in yes. the other one of them was the result of what would happen if they keep with the harvesting strategy, right? Um, yeah, here, the enforcement is keeping with the with their actual harvesting strategies. Uh, it's, it's enforcing all the uh, legislation, so uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So for that result, apparently that's not very successful. So shouldn't they change the legislation and the management protocols? Probably. Uh, so far, they, they, they use a lot of um, a lot of um, um, most of the rules concern the fragmentation of, of the forest. So not uh, harvesting two individuals that are not too close together. So it's one out of three plants or th this kind of of um, regulations um, but yes this this uh, simulation shows that we should look at herbivory and and we should consider herbivory even more maybe than fragmentation um, and uh, and yes the the reduction because fishing is also a very uh, big activity in this area so they fish a lot and herbivores just proliferate very very much so maybe um, reducing the fishing pressure in, in this area would be very important but again, yes, uh, in Chile there was also a very huge um, uh, social crisis, COVID hit very hard and a lot of, of people on the coast just decided to, to collect what they had uh, available. So, so you, even we, we had a, there was a little marine protected area in front of the station and every day you, you would have some divers collecting things, some fishermen, they would just give the back to the station and fish on the other side and, and nothing would happen. They would call the police, but nothing would happen. So, very hard. Okay, thank you. Uh, some quick questions, please, Victor. <laughs> Sorry, we don't, we don't have too much time left. Yeah, no Sorry. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, Guillaume. Um, um, it was super clear and really nice. It really seemed like you really got into the subject, so it was really pleasant to, to hear that. Um, I had a few questions. Um, I'm going to start with the main one, I guess, <laughs> and we'll see if we can go further. Um, I mean, a lot of times you mentioned uh, the fact that you had a really impact, like, important effect of herbivory and not so much a, uh, like, a clear effect of a fragmentation at the same time. Yes. But in the, like, really in the beginning of your presentation, during the intro, you did say that herbivory is more intense in the edge. So yes. it's clearly also related to fragmentation, right? It's also related to fragmentation. Yeah. And I wanted to know, like, to you, why is it that we, you have more uh, herbivory in in those edges than, than in the, the middle of the forest? What is going on? Yes. Um, what have been what what we've seen in in the data is that uh, there are way more um, juveniles on the edge of the forest, and we also know that um, herbivores like to graze on these because they are just easier to to graze on, and and uh, so. We don't know if if they are uh, they are um, herbivores because there are lots of juveniles, or if uh, if juveniles are, are here because um, or if herbivores are here because they they don't enter the, um, there is some other mechanism that make them not enter the, the, the forest very much. So so I, I we don't know exactly the reason why there are more um, herbivores on the on the edge and more grazing. And even, I'm talking about herbivores density. I'm not even talking about grazing, because behavior of 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 herbivores could be very different. Maybe they move a lot, and we we see more of them on the edge. But also, maybe there, there are many in the forest that we we don't see. We, they are, like the discs are very big. Maybe they are just hidden and uh, very hard to estimate. So there is probably a, a like. A, a, a correlation between uh, between fragmentation and um, and herbivory, but um, yeah. 
touch with you. A little bit first. Do you have any idea? Like, do you have a hypothesis? I don't, doesn't have to be like your. Well, like my, my main uh, hypothesis is just that um, lots of juveniles settle on the edge of the forest because there is um, there is space, there is light, and they still they still have this uh, forest formation. So maybe there is also a buffer for uh, with the uh, with all the wave disturbance and. Uh, and everything, so probably they settle more on the edge, and herbivores uh, like to be on the edge because of this reason. Because uh, they like to graze on these trees. One last question, please, in the group chat. I, I don't know as many, but you can. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Discuss I'm just going to say in the in the topic then, because you also said that one of the like the paper that you mentioned in the end, right? You lived uh, the yeah. tree. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned the importance of predators um, yes. coming back and recolonizing yes. when you have the the turf. And you said it was important because they predate on the herbivores. Yes. So maybe there is a time. Um, yeah. It's very. Yeah. Um, um, uh, because they would. Uh, could, could you repeat it? Uh, I'm not sure. So you made a link with that yeah. reference yeah. between uh, predators and herbivores. Yeah. You also made a link between herbivores and fragmentation. I'm yeah. trying you to get to the okay. final okay. circle. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if there is a direct link, um, but it would be nice to investigate. Okay, that's perfect. All right. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to apologize for two things. We have trouble with the, the stream, as you we also have trouble with the online streaming, so if your family and friends are trying to watch online, it's cut off at about half. Uh, so, yeah, sorry about that. So yes, it's trying to work on the streaming, but it doesn't seem to... I'm going to zoom up just a little bit here. It keeps doing the same. Yeah. Olivier, is it okay if I have a little timer going as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, Switch off and turn off, maybe we can. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the the webcam. Ah, uh, this one, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Give it a go. Uh, My name is Gabrielle Page, and today I will be presenting my thesis work on environmental impact assessment in the Belgian North Sea. I conducted my thesis at ILVO, a research institute located in Ostende in Belgium on the Southern North Sea. And now I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So the benthos is a term which encompasses organisms living on, near, or below the seafloor. Benthic organisms play a really important role in ecosystem function, and they also tend to be sensitive to uh, amphibogenic disturbance. As such, they're an insightful indicator into marine ecosystem health. 
The European Union has a legislation called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. This legislation mandates all member states to achieve what is called a good environmental status in their marine waters. This, uh, the MSFD has outlined 11 different focus areas called descriptors, and two of those descriptors are going to be of interest to us today, biodiversity and seafloor integrity. In order to figure out whether an ecosystem is in good environmental status or not, there are three main steps that are required. First, you need to assign your samples to a habitat. Then you need to establish some reference or baseline conditions. And finally, you can calculate some indicators and compare them to your, um, to your reference data. Uh, so the aim of this study was to assess the status of benthic ecosystems in the Belgian part of the North Sea, specifically through criterion D65 of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. This criterion addresses the extent of the negative impacts of anthropogenic pressures on the condition of the habitat. This was done in three main ways. Uh, first, calculating a diverse set of indicators. Uh, using a baseline to determine trends over time, and finally, integrating these indicator scores together into one overall score. Uh, so the first step is uh, the uh, this habitat assignment. This map shows the Belgian part of the North Sea, as well as the five different habitats that have been described there. Uh, the habitats are characterized by species composition as well as sediment properties such as grain size and mud content. And generally speaking, from the more offshore areas to the more inshore areas, the sediment grain size tends to decrease and the mud content tends to increase. I will call particular attention to this habitat, the Abra Alba habitat here, uh, which has particular importance for conserv conservation purposes and we're going to talk more about it in a minute. Okay, to, so to put some faces to the names, I've included some pictures here of the organisms after which those five habitats were named. So starting in the top left, we've got Abra Alba, Hesiolura elongata, Macoma baltica, Mahelona johnsoni, Empty Slay, and Mestis cirrhosa, uh, bivalves and polychaetes. Okay, so the next step is to determine some reference conditions. And so the baseline data set, which was used for this purpose, was collected in the Belgian North Sea between 1994 and 2012. Um, it covers all five habitats that were shown on the map and was obtained using a Van Veen sediment grab, as shown on the picture. The benthic fauna was identified to the species level or lowest possible taxonomic level. And the resulting data set underwent a series of filtering and aggregation steps to stay consistent with previous MSFD assessments in Belgium and be taxonomically up to date because um, taxon names change uh, quite regularly. Finally, um, so the indicator calculation is the third step. Uh, the data set which was used for this assessment was collected between 2010 and 2020. Um, it was collected using the same methods as the baseline data set, uh, but there was data available only for four out of the five uh, habitats presented on the map. So the Mahelona Ensis Lay habitat is not included in this assessment. Uh, there were two different treatments that were considered. The impact stations were located within areas of human activities such as sand extraction or dredge disposal, whereas the control um, stations were located outside of these designated areas. And finally, to stay consistent with the MSFD cycle in Belgium, there were two different periods uh, considered. And before we look at um, some of our results, uh, I need to tell you about environmental quality ratios, or EQRs. This is a ratio of an assessment value for an indicator over a reference value. And the range of EQR possible values, usually between 0 and 1, can be divided into five status classes bad, poor, moderate, good, and high. And so the good environmental status we're looking for for the MSFD usually corresponds to an EQR score of 0 0.6 or higher. So now we're gonna dive into some results for the Abra Alba habitat for eight different indicators. Uh, so the first indicator, Becky, um, 
combines four different parameters. So it measures uh, species richness, species composition, as well as density and biomass. And multivariate AMBI is an indicator specifically looking at the effects of uh, nutrient pollution. And um, on these graphs, we've got control stations represented in blue, impact stations in orange. On the line graph, we've got standard error as a band of matching color. And then the good environmental status is represented by a green uh, band at the top. And then we've got the bad status graph at the bottom, so the lowest possible rating. Uh, next, we have um, Margalef diversity, which is a measure of structural diversity. Relative Margalef would be the EQR equivalent, so the score was divided by a reference value. Uh, we're seeing a pretty consistent trend for control areas uh, in this indicator, slight decrease for the impact areas. Um, community bioturbation potential is represented here. This is a functional indicator looking at a benthic community's capacity to uh, modify its environment through particle reworking. Uh, and this uh, indicator decreased over the assessment period and is well into the bad status class here. Uh, here we have some uh, functional diversity indicators. These indicators measure diversity not in taxonomic terms, but rather in terms of what role each taxon plays in ecosystem function. So we've got functional richness on the left, uh, which is the amount of functional space filled by a community, and then Rao's quadratic entropy on the right is a measure of functional dispersion. Uh, these functional diversity indicators stayed pretty consistent over the assessment period. And then finally, we've got some trawling related indicators here. Trawling is a human activity which occurs throughout the Belgian North Sea, both in the control areas and in the impact areas. So it's important to um, have an indicator looking specifically at that activity. Uh, TDI is the Trawling Disturbance Index, and this indicator here represents the proportion of uh, organisms in a sample that are highly sensitive to trawling over the ones that are uh, less sensitive. And so a high score in this indicator represents a high level of degradation. And so these different indicators uh, we just went over for the Abra Alba habitat were calculated for all four habitats, minus BPC. Uh, and then the scores were integrated all together into one overall score using the Nested Environmental Assessment Status Tool, or NEAT tool. Um, and the results are displayed here in these bar graphs for each habitat. Um, so again, you know, we've got a good environmental status, which is an EQR score of 0.6 or higher. So you can see that uh, it is not reached for any of the habitats. These pie charts above the bar graphs represent the share of control areas versus impact areas within a habitat. And then the pie chart all the way on the left <coughs> describes the share that each habitat occupies within the uh, greater Belgian North Sea. So the largest habitat is the Hesionura habitat here, and then the second largest is the Mistus Sirosa habitat. Um, so looking at these results, uh, we can see that in the Abra Alba habitat, the scores in the impact areas are consistently lower than in the control areas, uh, which suggests that the human activities occurring there, which is dredge disposal, uh, has a negative impact on the benthic communities. Um, looking at the Hizenura and Longata habitat, we're seeing a, an opposite trend where the impact areas uh, tend to be scoring higher than the control. In this sandy offshore environment, uh, the human activities taking place is sand extraction. And previous study have shown that uh, sand extraction can uh, bolster biodiversity locally by increasing habitat heterogeneity. So now uh, op opportunistic species or species characteristic of muddy environments can live alongside species characteristic of the coarse offshore sands of this habitat. Uh, in the Makoma Baltica habitat, which is an inshore muddy environment, we're seeing some very low scores for the control areas. This can be explained by a very large abundance and biomass of the bivalve Makoma Baltica, which we saw a picture of earlier, um, in the assessment period compared to the baseline. And so that very large deviation is what drove the lower scores 
in the control areas. And finally, in the Nifty Tirosa habitat, which is a sandy offshore environment similar to Hesio Nurayo Gata, we're seeing some similar trends uh, in these two habitats where the impact areas score higher, uh, which again can be attributed to the higher diversity found in sand extraction areas due to the habitat heterogeneity that this activity creates. Uh, so to conclude, the benthic ecosystems in the Belgian part of the North Sea uh, are found to be in moderate status. This is consistent with the opinions of regional experts. And this status has been moderate for the last couple of cycles of the MSFD assessment. And it's consistent with the level of human pressures on this uh, environment as well, which has remained constant, if not slightly increasing over time. So constant level of pressure, constant condition of the habitat. Uh, we've seen that um, the sand extraction areas can have this kind of positive impact on biodiversity um, in the impact areas. However, um, a, uh, a widespread uh, sand extraction uh, in the Belgian North Sea would result in uh, making the habitat totally homogenous. And that would be a decrease of habitat diversity with adverse effects on biodiversity as well. Um, it is important to note that the baseline data set which was used for this assessment is not a pristine data set. Uh, indeed, the Southern North Sea in general has been used extensively by humans for centuries, and pristine conditions are no longer available in this area. Uh, however, it's still important to use a baseline in order to determine trends over time. And then uh, indicator integration is a really useful tool for uh, synthesis of results and communication, uh, but it must be used mindfully because the number of indicators used in the assessment and the type of indicators used highly influences the overall score. So it's possible to skew the score in one direction or another if you use many indicators of one type, many related indicators. Uh, and to conclude, I'll say that having an up-to-date and accurate knowledge of the status of an ecosystem is critical to implementing uh, conservation and marine resource management strategies that are thoughtful and effective. And my hope is that this D65 assessment can contribute to that effort in Belgium. I would like to thank my supervisor, as well as all the people involved in the collection of the data that I used. And uh, thank you all for your time and attention today. about a minute left if you are, but I think you made your point, so no use in talking more if you don't need it. Uh, you want sure, to start? So, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, and I had a few questions. I, I'm just more curious because your presentation was very clear. Mm -hmm. I also wanted you uh, to commend you on your calm and your, <laughs> your posture. Like, uh, very clear all the time. <laughs> very impressed. Um, and I wanted also, I just wanted to know because you you tried a lot of um, a lot of indices, and yeah. you just mentioned that in the end we kind of have to be mindful of what we're doing. Yeah. And it was like, from what you know now, because mm -hmm. you've studied for six months these environments, mm -hmm. um, which one, considering the impacts that you know that happen in 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 that area, mm -hmm. is there one that you think works best, or would you say a combination of a few? Is there one that you wouldn't recommend, or you think it's not like it doesn't really capture the, the mm -hmm. image there. Before um, before choosing these indicators that I ended up using for this assessment, I reviewed the literature for available you know benthic ecosystem quality indicators, and um, and then made a selection process to um, end up with with these. Um, each indicator looks at the benthic ecosystem in a slightly different way, measures a slightly different thing. So it gives you a little a little picture, but using a combination is really important because, uh, for example, multivariate OMB is like um, really good at looking at the effects of like nutrient pollution, but like not so good at evaluating the impact of like physical uh, pressures on the ecosystem. So it's good to have complementary 
indicators or like the structural versus the functional indicators like that's really good to bring them all in uh, is there one that I would choose um, there the actually the Margalef diversity was uh, highly correlated with um, several of, of the indicators from like different families that I used so that was kind of cool to see that oh actually like Margalef is like pretty good yeah pr pretty good indicator like if I had to choose just one maybe I would pick this one and then coming back to the Margalef because it was the only other question that I had um, and maybe you didn't mention it and I just got disconnected for a second but um, uh, you, you have to use baseline for that one right you have to you have a you have a um, could you just go back? To yes. Slide? Yeah. So to calculate it, you have yeah, um, you have to to get the species richness, and then you have a you compare it, right? Uh, yes. For the for the relative margulef, yeah. that is what is necessary. You can calculate margulef diversity on like a single a single sample, and you don't need a reference, and then you get a number. But indeed, for this yeah. assessment, we uh, divided by a reference value. Right. Uh, and and then I just wanted to know which one did you use as a reference value? I don't know if you yeah. mentioned it. I did not mention it. Um, for every indicator, for every relative indicator uh, that was calculated, uh, the reference value was obtained from the baseline data set, and it was the 99th percentile value, uh, highest value for that indicator. Um, so because this baseline data set is, is, is not a pristine data set, doesn't represent pristine conditions, we wanted to find the highest possible value minus the outliers, so not the max value, but 99th percentile. What would be the problem then if you chose a pristine value? What would be the problem? Yeah, what oh, would, it you would you expect to see? Oh, uh, <laughs> probably lower scores for all the indicators uh, because, yeah, well, yeah we, we don't know what the pristine environment looks like, but it's probably more diverse and healthy than what we have now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Um, it's here probably with uh, using uh, such a large number of uh, indicators. And the, the problem that I see is that uh, many of them are strongly correlated. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, perhaps you don't have uh, a real picture because. Uh, if uh, they are strongly correlated and you have uh, two or three of them which describe or say almost the same, yep. so at the end, uh, that group of uh, indicators get a strong weight in the final picture. I mean, how, how can you manage this? And should be better to, to take just independent indicators mm. and forget all uh, indicators based on diversity because at the end the diversity indices they, they, they give almost the same result mm -hmm. so forget yes uh, use one uh, diversity index and then set up others or yes the, the whole community structure so the, the complete table and work with uh, multiple analysis yes uh, I think you bring up a really good point that uh, for the marine strategy framework directive we have to assess the status of the ecosystem but um, there's no specific way that has been outlined how to do that and so it's up to each country to devise the best way that they can mm -hmm. and so there's not really a, a, a precedent or, a, or an established method and so the <coughs> the idea here was to use yeah to use some structural indicators to use some functional indicators and then to use some indicators which looked at um, the specifically the two largest, um, let's say, adverse effects of human activities on uh, the benthos in the Belgian North Sea, which is uh, nutrient pollution and trawling. And so mm -hmm. that is what determined the choice of these eight indicators, as well as some, um, let's say, some a desire to remain a little bit consistent or comparable with, for example, um, indicators used in the OSPAR convention. So relative Margaret is uh, is an indicator used there. So um, it, it was important to to use some of those to kind of continue along uh, that precedent. Um, 
and then yes, it's more coming in the last slide. Yeah, when you compare. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm, I think in, in our alba, apparently there is a, an effect or by some difference because we don't have confidence intervals or a range of variation for every that's very difficult to compare. So and uh, it seems that uh, there is no impact or the indicators are not able to detect anything. For example, in, uh, in almost except uh, our alba in mm -hmm. the others, apparently the result is either the indicators are not able to detect any difference or uh, the difference doesn't exist. So, mm -hmm. and, uh, so uh, I think some uh, confidence interval or some natural range of variation for mm -hmm. those indicators should be needed in, in this graph, in, just to make the graph more interpretable. Yes, uh, and the, so the, the NEETS tool which was used for this integration um, is, is essentially a weight average of, of the different indicators yes. and um, they're, they're weighed according to the, according to the area that each, yeah, each treatment occupies within the habitat. So it, it, um, that is, that, that's essentially what it does. And, um, and so it, it provides, yeah, it, it just kind of provides a, a single value for each yeah, treatment and, and period. <coughs> and, um, I agree that this process could be could be further refined, and this was the first time that um, indi indicator integration was was used in in a Belgium assessments, and uh, and uh, yeah, I hope we can we can yeah. make this more refined in the future. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. And some last uh, questions. Yeah, just regarding the the I uh, have already mentioned that uh, to the question made by Julio. The NEET score uh, is a weighted average. Yeah. So uh, you haven't explained that in, in the material methods, and we haven't read the, the thesis itself. Mm -hmm. How were weight? How was the weight assigned to the different indicators? Because we some questions have already addressed the problem of uh, correlation between indicators. So mm -hmm. how were the weights uh, given? Some were given a higher importance, for instance, some were multiplied by two, and some others were multiplied by zero point five. Or um, I I didn't uh, I didn't explain this well enough the first time. The the weight is for each it is is um, about the area, the spatial extent of of uh, like control areas mm. and impact areas within the habitat, and then again the weight of the entire habitat in the overall score for the Belgian North Sea is done according to its relative um, size in the Belgian North Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, each indicator was weighed the same. Uh, each habitat was not exactly weighed the same. This Nifty Sirosa habitat, though it shares many characteristics with the uh, offshore sandy Kizunura habitat, is also very much a transitional area between the offshore environments and the kind of inshore finer sand environments and so sometimes it can be hard to define very precise boundaries for this habitat and so our confidence in the uh, habitat assignment for that habitat is a little bit lower so this habitat was weighed half as much in the integration um, compared to the others so in, in terms of the calculation of the of the score Mm -hmm. All the indicators that you were using to calculate the score have the same uh, weight. Correct. It's a matter of area, not a matter of the weight of the different indicators. Exactly. Ah, okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. And we move on to our last presentation.
can I start? If you're ready. Okay, perfect. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, hello everyone, my name is Lisa and today I'm presenting my thesis. I'm going to take you on a 15 minute journey on hormone treated seagrass. Uh, but before I start, I really do want to thank my promoter and supervisor, Anne and Ricardo, for being great scientists and just amazing mentors also. All right, so starting with the introduction, what are seagrasses? They're marine flowering plants and the chosen species was the Sela marina for my study. They are quite important. As we all know, they do carry out many ecosystem services, but they are also, like, despite that, they are quite threatened by various uh, anthropogenic activities, such as pollution and others. Uh, to reverse the gray habitat loss and just overall declining trends that seagrass are faces, of course, there are, as Guillaume said, uh, seagrass restoration is now a hot topic, and seagrass restoration can uh, be either sod or seed based. Sod based restoration consists in taking sods from a donor meadow and then transplanting them to a new location, whereas seed based restoration consists in harvesting, storing, and then broadcasting seeds to a new location. Uh, the latter is often preferred because it is quite cost effective, uh, it's less labor intensive, it usually like, yields more genetic diversity, and there's a higher amount of seeds per hectare. Uh, however, the main bottleneck of this um, method is the low seed germination. As you can see in the slide, uh, studies on Zostera marina usually uh, have found germination percentages of 5 to 10 percent of all the seeds, which is quite low. So to contrast this very low germination um, rate, seed germination can be boosted or implemented by tweaking some factors that can be external or internal. For example, the external factor, like the environmental ones, uh, we do know that light, temperature, and salinities uh, send the cues to the seeds as when it's the proper time to germinate. And often these environmental factors are coupled with more internal ones to the seeds. So for example, hormones, which are the hot topic of my thesis. So uh, the hormones that you see here, gibberellic acids, strigolactin, and carikins, were chosen because of their stimulant um, activities, like their, their germination stimulant. Um, the GA is the most known one. It's often uh, used in agriculture to enhance crop yields. And strigolactin and carikins, instead, they're quite a novel find, and they're known to promote germination, the first one in parasitic vegetation, and the second one in fire follower plants. So. Yeah, and as I was saying, because they're quite new hormones, that's a bit of a research gap. There's no studies done yet on uh, strigolactin and carikin application to seagrass. Uh, so this is why the study objectives were to assess the effects of the exogenous hormone application, so the three hormones I spoke about before, in multiple concentrations and across different sterilizing solutions and seed generation, as these are also known to concur to the germination success. Uh, of course, the effects will be studied on Zostera marina and specifically on its in vitro germination and in vitro seedling development. Why am I also mentioning seedling development now? Because the main aim is, as written there, to identify the specific treatments which do enhance germination without hindering the plant. And to see that the plant has not been harmed, we need to go and monitor the seedlings as well. Because, of course, the overarching aim is to have more seedling for further, like, potential use in seagrass restoration. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the methods. First of all, we collected the shoots in Germany, in Hamburg Hallig, in September 21 and 2022. Then we took them back to the lab and separated the seeds from the inflorences. You can see in the second picture, it was quite a labor intensive uh, process. Then the seeds were uh, treated with copper sulfate, the CUSO4, um, to prevent infections. And then we went on to prepare the hormone solutions to give to the seeds. The stock solutions for GA and strigolactin were prepared by dissolving the, the hormones in ethanol, whereas the carikin was a bit of a more fun process because we ended up burning uh, plant material in a control fire in the lab and then dissolving the smoke into sterilized seawater. So that was our third hormone. And then some of the seeds were sterilized. Uh, and now, oh yeah, and the last thing, these last two uh, steps were done under sterile condition, except for the carikin burning part. Uh, and from this point onward, everything uh, that happened was in sterile conditions. So the seeds were always kept uh, in sterile conditions. All right, for the experimental setup, here you see the three main conditions that we kept. So temperature, light, and seawater. Um, they were all chosen the way they were 
because they were mimicking the natural conditions in the Wadden Sea in spring, which is when the seeds are known to germinate. And then as for the experimental design, we had 525 seeds and they were divided into the hormone groupings that you see here. Each hormone was um, given into, like, to the experimental design in 10 concentrations. Uh, and also the hormone groupings were also grouped into age groups, so uh, 2022 seeds and 2021 seeds, and also whether the seeds were sterilized or not sterilized. So going on to the monitoring, the seeds were monitored for over two months. And we monitored, of course, first seed germination. Uh, we obtained uh, binary data for that. So every couple of days, we would go to the experimental setup, look at all the seeds, and determine whether they had germinated or not. Then secondly, seed in development. Uh, I did take photos, as you can see here. There is a camera mounted on the microscope. So that was my setup. These are all my seeds in my petri dishes. Um, and again, every couple, two to three days, I went and took photos to then take measurements of the seedling development. And then lastly, the seeds were also checked for viability. So we assessed the viability with tetrazolium chloride assay, uh, which basically is a colorless compound that turns viable seeds red. So that one that you see is a viable seed. All right, I've been talking about germination and development, but uh, to measure them and to do stats on them, we actually do need to quantify them. So seed germination was considered as germination rate and germination percentage analyzed respective, respectively with binomial regressions, Kruskal Wallis, and Wilcoxon Rankson test. As for the development, you can see the pipeline here. We went from photographing the seedlings, uh, measuring them with ImageJ, and then doing stats on in R. Uh, so what we measure, we measure the cumulative length, which are a sum of the cotyledon, the first leaf, the second leaf, and the root length. Uh, we measured it over time and we also measured it uh, as an average and as a maximum cumulative length. Okay, so finally going to the results. Uh, of the 525 seeds, actually only 39 of them germinated, which is 7% uh, of them and it's quite low, I'm aware. Uh, just looking at the graph here, uh, we have seen though that the hormone treatments uh, cause increased germination. So that's great. Uh, as you can see in the graph, the first bar in each graph that I'm going to show you also after is the control treatment. And all my analyses are always related from the hormone treatment to the control, of course, to compare them. And then the color, the color you have the darker colors that correspond to the higher concentrations of the hormones. So as you can see here, it looks like uh, higher concentrations of GA promote a higher germination percentage. Uh, oppositely, no significance was found for the strigolactin and carotene application, and the germination percentage was always uh, around or less than 10%. Looking at the germination rates, we perform binary regression, and here we do see an increased germination for GA seeded seeds compared to the control, uh, also in higher concentrations again, and we also see it for strigolactin but for a uh, quite varied concentration. All right, so I'm going to start with discussing this first part. The seed germination was indeed in line with the present literature on the Stella Marina. Uh, we do know, like, this topic is quite understudied, but we, knew, do, we do know that there have been exogenous GA applications to Zostera Capricorni and Simodosia nodosa, and they both are in line with the results found in my study, so the GA also increased their germinations. Whereas for carotenes and strigolactin, uh, this was the first known application of these hormones to this plant. So, of course, we do need to carry out further studies uh, because the hormones effects are quite complex, but also they're most likely species-specific. And then, lastly, we hypothesized that there was a trade-off between the sterilization solutions that I mentioned before and the hormonal germination improvement. So, going on to seeding development, uh, only... 12 of the 39 seeds that germinated then went on to develop their first leaf. So you can see how the numbers are really, really decreasing. Um, however, no seeds, uh, no seedlings, sorry, were um, showing abnormalities, which is what we wanted to prove. And then when we, when we do look at the cumulative length uh, a long time, we do see that actually strigolactin is increasing it significantly for uh, the five milligrams per liter 
um, concentration. However, oppositely to the germination, we see that GA is uh, decreasing the cumulative length along with pyrazine. And when we look at the average cumulative length, the results are further corroborated. Uh, you can see in the graph, again, this is the control that we always compare to. And this time we see that lower concentrations of stribolactone have way higher cumulative lengths compared to the control. And similar to the slide I showed you before, GA and carotene uh, didn't have much effect in the mother. Okay, so as I was saying, the main takeaway point here is that no negative effects were found on the, on the seedlings, so no negative morphology changes, which is what we wanted because we are looking for seed, seedlings that are suitable to be then restored uh, in the wild. We do, of course, need further studies again on hormone influence seagrass seedlings because, for example, the only study found was on GA application, not on stricolactin and carotin for seagrass species. But the study found on Simodosia nodosa actually found uh, increased leaf length for um, the, this species. Uh, and that result is in contrast with what we found here. So definitely further studies. Uh, however, the stricolactin application did improve seedling growth. Uh, and the stricolactin function uh, is quite uh, ambiguous sometimes because it is known to hinder uh, boosting and, uh, sorry, to hinder branching and budding uh, of other plants, but it's also known to increase secondary growth. Uh, and yeah, and then the last thing, uh, this graph again uh, shows that seed viability decreases with seed age, so that's a notion that uh, we know from literature. And here on the top, these are 2022 seeds and these are 2021 seeds, so you can definitely see how this one went on to further develop uh, way better. All right. Uh, so as for seed viability, only 38% of the seeds were proven viable by the CCC assay. But if we do calculate then the final germination percentage only on the viable seeds and not on the uh, total seeds, we have a 19%, which is a bit higher. And then also the viability assessment confirmed the idea that younger seeds are more viable. As we can see here, that the 2022 seeds had higher viability percentages than the 2021 one. All right, so for further improvements, definitely adding uh, these three points. So <coughs> seed cost clarification, sterilization techniques, and um, further salinity acclimatization to the experimental design would further enhance germination. And then looking at more replication of this experiment across spring and summer would definitely shed light on whether there was a um, a timing component to the germination results and the germination response that we saw. A bigger sample size is always a great idea, but especially for this experiment, as we saw, the numbers decrease quite rapidly. And then lastly, in this experiment, I gave hormones to seeds and then uh, assessed the effects on the seedlings. Whereas in literature, what I found on model species or model plants, um, the hormone application was done directly to the seedlings. So that's also something that can be further compared and then to, to conclude, so this study had hope, has hopefully uh, brought forward uh, our understanding on the topic. And then the two main takeaway points are, like the main findings of the study are that we found that higher GA concentrations did uh, enhance Zostera marina seed germination and lower strigolactin concentration enhanced uh, Zostera marina seed in development, whereas the carotene application seemed to have little to no effect. As I said, the hormone treated seedlings showed no abnormalities, so they were classified as um, suitable for restoration. And then uh, definitely further research could be carried out in comparing, like having an integrated approach with using both low strigolactin and high carotene concentration together. Uh, because we do know from existing literature that strigolactin is also uh, regulating GA in some way, so it could be playing a role also in promoting germination through that. Uh, so yeah, that's it. These are my references. Uh, these are my contact details. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. These are 14 minutes and 30 seconds. So that's uh, good. Yeah. We can start with you. Yeah, thank you. These are very clear uh, uh, presentations.
Uh, I have just a couple of methodological questions. One yep. is when you were describing the conditions, the environmental conditions for the seedlings, mm -hmm. it was 10 degrees and then uh, long day periods. Yeah, long day periods. Uh, so 16 hours of light and then 10 degrees. So the seeds were in a, a climate room with always the same condition. They were under lamps that were automatically switching on and off. And then the salinity. So we always use sterilized seawater mm -hmm. and the salinity was of 20 uh, 28 per thousand, and that's uh, the, the one that you usually found in the Wadden Sea in Spain. So that's why we chose them. Oh, so okay, so those conditions are compatible with natural environmental yeah, conditions. Yeah, so such we a low temperature with long day, day periods. Exactly, yeah. We try to keep them as optimal as possible to focus on the effects of the hormones. Oh. And then another question regarding the uh, 221, 222. Those are seeds that were collected in 2021 and kept in the lab and then yeah. collected again. So it's just a matter of the age that they have been stored. Yeah, it? so it's the age that they were collected, but also how long they've been stored. So seagrass seeds are usually found, like stored in cold storage. Uh, and so I'm going to go back really quick. Uh, that is also the reason that my design wasn't fully crossed because in 2022 I was oops there she is uh, nope in 2022 I was able to decide whether I wanted to sterilize or not sterilize my I seeds but in 2021 they were already stored uh, so we only had the sterilized uh, older seeds. Another final question: yeah, Judging for the results and mm -hmm. considering that you are looking about the a solution for the restoration mm -hmm. of seagrass beds and seeing that the, the success is very low, do you think that this strategy should be abandoned and going for the sod restoration mm -hmm. instead of the seed restoration? Mm, I think there's definitely potential in these studies and as I was saying like they're really really just starting out so I would definitely not abandon them quite yet and also because sod restoration it is quite like a bit like it's more invasive on the donor meadow uh, so if we can find a way that's less invasive, I would definitely put more time into that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and if I can add one more thing, yeah. uh, also they've just sequenced uh, in 2016 the Zostera Marina genome. So definitely with all those tools, uh, I feel like also a hormone, like a way um, going straight into the hormones aided by uh, the hormone, the um, genetic tools would definitely kind of um, mm -hmm. speed up the process. Thank you very much, Alicia. And uh, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I presume that uh, it's expensive. And, uh, and my question is that that's a very low intensive mm -hmm. uh, method and um, yeah, look expensive. And uh, the final mm -hmm. objective is restoration. And uh, do you have an idea of survival of uh, small plants in the field after uh, germination. So they are, they have an idea of viability mm -hmm. of uh, seeds or uh, germins in the mm -hmm. field after you get uh, the germination. Yeah. So Th that's the, the critical point. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know about my seed personally, because now they're still in the lab. Uh, like my seed is, uh, didn't um, take part, like I didn't take part in that, but I'm still monitoring those seeds. Uh, and they are in the lab, they're in tanks, and they're being so like, because now they were, the seeds were, you can see here, the well plates. Um, they were in, in tiny well plates, and then they were moved when they germinated to Petri dish, and then now they've been moved to a bigger tank in which they're being acclimatized to further condition. And so the step after would be to then go and plant them to the field. Uh, but even just when doing transplants, so taking healthy, adult seagrass from one uh, location to the other, uh, sometimes uh, they, they die anyway. So definitely taking plants from the lab would be uh, also j just as hard as transplanting them with the sod uh, matter, if not a bit more. Uh, but definitely the upside, I would say, of the lab is that it is a controlled environment and we get to play around with all these so uh, things. Your, your personal impression is that uh, this method is it useful or not? I would say that if we do find a way to uh, boost the germination more, definitely yes, because compared uh, to all the stress that you, you would get from going straight forward in the field, so like not perfect conditions, predation, yeah. 
many other things. I think it's still, uh, like, if, if we do, un like, understand it more and find further results, I want to yeah. say that. Thank you. Thank you. I just really wanted to, to commend you on mm. all your work. And Thanks. it seems like you made you, you work a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> good job. <laughs> um, and you were able to also like really present. I think you probably present all your work, most of it. Most of it, yeah. You, like sometimes you have to make decisions so that yeah. it's not that as crowded. And you did present this with a lot of information, but I think it was very clear and. Mm -hmm. I never felt overwhelmed by it, so very good job. Um, I think it was not any step to do what you did, so good job. Um, I also had a, a little question about the mortality there, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you didn't much answer. And I wanted you to go just back to um, the figure where you have the different tricks, like the different levels of um, of the first home hormone. Can you go to the results? Was it seed germination or? Yeah, seed germination. So the this germination one. Rate. I think it's still the next one, maybe? This one. Yeah? yeah this one. So um, here you, s you see that there is no difference between the GA levels from 13 to 20, right? That's what you saw when you compared. Yeah. Maybe it was the slide just before. Yeah, I think it was this yeah, one. This one. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't find any significant differences between 13 to 20. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And do you, do you, so, do you see a trend at least? Mm -hmm. my, my question is, in terms of cost effectiveness, because yeah. I have no clue mm -hmm. if this is very expensive or not, mm -hmm. not to increase from 13 to, to 20. Uh, do you think, it, what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Like, if you couldn't make it even better now, and if you stick mm -hmm. to those values, which one would you say is better? Well, I would definitely, because we did take the, basically, like, we bought the ornaments and then made the stock solutions. Um, so as for cost, I would say, uh, like, yes, the ornament is quite expensive, but then the dilutions, uh, I wouldn't say they're not. So um, like, there's not such a difference in price between, for example, 13 and 20. Um, so I would definitely focus on the higher concentrations because of the results found. Uh, maybe I would go also a little bit higher. Uh, the studies that we found on other seagrass species uh, went from one milligram per liter to 300. And some of the most promising ones were around uh, 20 and 50 also. So I would probably try and fill that gap from my 20 to the 50 that I found in literature. So that's where I would go for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Thank you. <laughs> right. Well, just a follow-up yeah. question on this, maybe. Uh, if you cite the literature that uh, the most promising concentration were around 200, why did you decide to stop at 20? Well, because we also wanted to see, like, we wanted to start with a smaller amount mm -hmm. and then see what would work. Okay. We knew that GA was going to be, like, not our golden child, but we knew that it was the one that probably was going to um, affect, like, germination positive the most, and that's what happened. So, because now we know that it's not towards the 1 mm -hmm. to 10 milligram side, yeah. then we can focus on the higher one. All right, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. From the chat, yeah. we have uh, Perla uh, Salzeri oh. congratulating you. Thank Such you. an amazing program, so proud of you. Safe work, TC. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>